Hi everybody, my name is Coy Cheshire. I'm the head graduate advisor here at the, for the PhD program at the UC Berkeley School of Information. Many of you know me, but those of you who don't know, um, it is my great honor and my wonderful privilege to welcome you to the second annual now, second annual iSchool PhD research reception. Yeah. So as you all may know, our PhD program attracts doctoral students from a wide different range of focal areas. They include computer science, of course, the social sciences, philosophy, law, just to name a few. Many of our students mix those different areas together. Our a wide range of different theories and theoretical perspectives, as well as many different methodological traditions, which you'll hear about uh, today. What you'll notice is that while the different approaches that our students take are just as varied as they are, at the heart of every single research problem you'll hear about today is a fundamental question issue dealing with information. So tonight, most of our presenters are going to be giving, a, I believe, a 10-minute talk. Uh, I should know, I'm the one keeping the time back there. So it'll be, it'll be a 10-minute talk followed by three minutes of Q&A. I should also mention two now of our presenters recently received their PhDs. Yoo-hoo! And these two presenters are going to be giving slightly, they are, they're blessed with slightly more time with a, a blessed, yes, 15 minutes uh, to give their talk with five minutes of Q&A. Um, I'm willing, as your timekeeper, I'll be back here at the back. Please watch me, all of you. Um, I'm willing to give you a little extra time if you're trying to finish something up, but we want to make sure everybody has some time for Q&A. Um, so that's, that's on me um, to some degree. Um, one other thing I want to mention is this microphone. Um, we're going to just ask, it doesn't, as you can tell, amplify into this room, but for those of you who don't know, we're recording this event as well, so when you have questions, please raise your hand and please wait uh, until we get the microphone to you during the Q&A. That way we can record it and it'll be captured. Otherwise, the poor folks who listen to it hear the answer, but they don't hear the question. Um, so after our first six presentations tonight, we're gonna take a 30 minute break. Uh, that should be roughly around 5.40 to 6.10-ish, depending on how we do on time. I will try, as I said, to keep us as close as possible to that time. Um, during that period, uh, you're welcome to have some food, some wine, please ask questions that maybe the question you didn't get to uh, during the Q&A, you can talk to the folks who presented during that period, but we're gonna start back here promptly at 6.10. Uh, we will then pick things back up with four more presentations, right? Four more presentations followed by reception. At the reception, again, more food, more wine, more great conversation. You can't go wrong with that. Um, so again, welcome. Thank you all for joining us as we showcase and celebrate, of course, the awesome work from our PhD students here in our PhD program. So to kick things off, I'm going to hand it over to Nitin, who's actually going to talk to us first about differential privacy, right? All right, thanks. It's an awesome mug. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey folks, um, in case you don't know me, my name is Nitin. I'm a PhD student here. And my work builds on algorithms, incentives, and statistics. And I'm excited with law and policy as well. So today I'm going to talk about epsilon voting. And this is actually a mechanism design paper that I worked on with uh, Paul Lukoski. Um, to answer some fundamental questions in differential privacy. Um, but before I do that, I actually want to go on a brief two-minute interlude and just talk about what differential privacy is for the rest of the room. So differential privacy is a mathematical promise. It promises that the presence or absence of a single individual data set can't change the answer that the algorithm produces by too much. So let's imagine it like this. Suppose that there are two parallel universes, or in the top universe, which a data set has my information, and we're in a, another universe in the bottom in a data set where my information isn't involved. The goal of differential privacy is to make sure that the presence or absence of my individual data element doesn't change the answer by too much, because in that way, if my individual data element doesn't change the answer by too much, an adversary couldn't learn too much about me, thereby leaking privacy about me. And you'll notice that uh, I put this little funny thing here that says outputs differ by no more than epsilon. Um, if you're allergic to math, make that any other letter you want that's not Greek. It's totally fine. We'll think of it as a small number. And what's kind of neat here is epsilon actually controls the level of privacy. So if we look back at the previous screen of the parallel universes, if epsilon goes as low as we can think of at zero, that means the output will never differ depending on whether I'm in analysis or not, which is perfect privacy. Nobody can learn anything about me because my presence or absence doesn't change anything. So that's the world of perfect privacy over there at zero. Alternatively, if we turn it all the way to God mode, wrong one, there we go, 
Um, this is like typical statistics where there's no privacy guarantees at all. And one thing we'll notice is there's actually a trade-off here between privacy and accuracy. The smaller I make that epsilon, the less useful results I'll get because the algorithm or computation can't really depend on my answer. So there's this fundamental trade-off here between privacy and accuracy. Um, so one thing is as we tune privacy, we tend to lose accuracy and vice versa. So one thing that's kind of neat here is because there's this trade-off, we can actually try to ask questions such as, is there a quote unquote sociable, social optimal value of epsilon to balance privacy and accuracy? Um, and Cynthia Dwork and Adam Smith actually say the choice of epsilon is essentially a social question. Um, and I, I agree in some sense that this is a social question, that you can set it epsilon with social concerns in mind. But this kind of punts on a fundamental issue of how is epsilon set currently. When you think about algorithm designers, we're usually like in hermetically sealed boardrooms making decisions about individuals that we might not know about. If I'm in a Silicon Valley conference room programming a differentially private algorithm, I might not be able to understand the privacy risks that undocumented migrants face um, by the presence or absence in taking part of something like a census. Or for folks in other countries in different social contexts. So while I kind of agree that epsilon is a social question, let's actually see if we can define that a little bit more. So one idea that Paul and I had was, why don't we actually try to ask people whose privacy is at risk, how much privacy they want, and try to aggregate these preferences. Uh, so, and if this works, this is kind of a, a watershed moment for differential privacy. It's a way to actually kind of say, for those individuals whose privacy is at risk, we can actually tune this parameter with your concerns in mind. Now, I want to state a big caveat here that I'm hoping somebody will ask me a question about a little later is, folks who are behavioral economics economists will say, but privacy preferences aren't very well defined. So what I want you to do now is just humor me for a moment and treat this as an assumption, and we'll come back to it at the end and see what the results actually mean then. <clears throat> so this is our stylized setting. We're going to move away from thinking about just differential privacy in general and try to define a mathematical formalism with just a few specific elements. So imagine we give uh, these users, or we'll call them voters in this case, a ballot of possible epsilon values that they can use. Uh, they can have a value of epsilon 1, epsilon 2, all the way to some value epsilon k. And like I said before, just humor me a moment and pretend this is interpretable to users. The idea now is can we somehow consolidate their votes that they give us into a chooser mechanism that can produce a value of epsilon that societal concern about accuracy for proper data analysis and the privacy concern of the individuals involved. And one thing we want to do is we don't want to just pick any arbitrary mechanism. One thing that's really neat about mechanism design is that you can actually try to design tools that meet uh, certain goals you have. So typically in game theory, we like to say, if I know the players and I know the rules, what outcomes can I get? And mechanism design asks kind of a second question. It says, if I know the players and I know the outcomes I want, how do you design the rules to get you to those things? And these are the goals we want to consider. And I'm going to talk about them, each one in depth. But just to state them, we want to characterize all chooser mechanisms that are simultaneously private, truthful, anonymous, and non-degenerate. So let's talk about what we mean by private. The whole goal of us trying to actually use this chooser mechanism was to figure out what value of epsilon to use in a later process m, some other differential private analysis. But people's privacy preferences may correlate with sensitive information. So if I don't actually report epsilon in a private way, that circumvents the whole point of using differential privacy. You can imagine that folks who are undocumented migrants might actually prefer very low values of epsilon in certain cases, which then an attacker could use to correlate and figure out their actual private status. So we want to make sure this mechanism is actually private. The second thing we want is the mechanism to be truthful. So what this means in the game theory literature is a user has two options in life. They can either honestly tell me their value for privacy that they want, or they can lie to me and try to game the system because they think they might get a more favorable outcome. Because we're trying to actually figure out societal preferences, we want people to tell us things honestly. We don't want to give them any reason to try to game our system. So in other words, we want to design a mechanism in which truth telling, being honest, is at least as good as lying to the mechanism. So formally, they have incentive to try to game it for a more preferable outcome. Uh, the third one is kind of an unfortunate term in a privacy talk, uh, but it means anonymous in game theory, and this is what it means more generally. We want the chooser mechanism 
to not care about the identity of the voters who voted. So if we imagine uh, Deirdre Mulligan and Paul Duguid over there, we want to make sure that the chooser mechanism doesn't use their identities. So if Paul and Deirdre were to switch votes, the mechanism would still behave exactly the same. In other words, we want to treat all individuals the same. And lastly, we want this mechanism to be non-degenerate. So um, a very silly way to get all the criteria we had before is to just create a mechanism that just disregards everybody's votes and does something randomly. That is private because it didn't use anybody's information. It's truthful because it doesn't matter if you tell the truth or lie, you're as good off telling the truth. And it's anonymous because I didn't use your identity. But this isn't responsive to the will of the people. It kind of destroys the point of trying to find a societally optimal epsilon. So we want to make sure the mechanism isn't some trash can that just ignores everything. It has to somehow use people's preferences in the process. So these are our four criteria. And uh, this is the research question Paul and I decided to attack. It was what social outcomes can be achieved through this epsilon voting procedure that are simultaneously truthful, private, anonymous, and non-degenerate, meeting our four goals. And um, we actually found there was exactly one mechanism that did this. So this is an informal statement of our big theorem. It says a mechanism is truthful, private, anonymous, and non-degenerate, if and only if it is what we called a randomized dictatorship with phantoms. So this doesn't look very good, and I'm about to make it worse. So uh, this is what we mean by that. So imagine in this case that there were six days of epsilon you could have voted for, epsilon 1 to epsilon 6. So n1 are the number of people who voted for epsilon 1, n2 are the number of people who voted for epsilon 2, and so on. What we actually found was in order to actually have privacy, we needed to create these fake phantom voters and kind of stuff the ballot box full of their votes to provide privacy here. So this is what the probability distribution would look like. And what we do is we have this probability distribution. We randomly sample one value from it. And that's the value of epsilon that is socially optimal. Now, I see a lot of disturbed faces. Good, this is the point. Um, let's just kind of talk through why this is at least truthful. Um, because in this case, you can, since we're randomly picking one value, it could be the case that your value is either picked or it's not. If your value is picked, you tell the truth. And if your value is not picked, it doesn't matter what you do, you're just a good offline or telling the truth. It's definitely anonymous because it only cares about the number of votes. It doesn't care about the order in which the votes were put in. Privacy is guaranteed because of these funny phantom votes that provide plausible deniability for the presence or absence of one vote. And it's non-degenerate because, well, it depends on people's votes. So, right, this is the kind of sad result, is that basically without any restrictions on the preferences, the only mechanism that can satisfy all four of these criteria is essentially saying put everybody's votes in this hat, stuff it full of phantom votes, and pick one value at random. So uh, what are the implications of this? Well, we can't maximize welfare because this mechanism isn't unanimous. If everybody votes for the same thing, it's not private, because the presence or absence of one individual could change the distribution. So you can't optimally uh, compute social welfare. You're not even Pareto efficient, which is kind of shocking. Almost everything you can think of is Pareto efficient in economics. And furthermore, it violates any reasonable notion that an individual would have about fairness. The mechanism we showed depends on, at most, the vote of one individual. It could have been one individual or the phantom. Questions? Uh, yeah. I see the game theory people. Huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, obvious question, probably, but the utility value of privacy is not the same for everyone. Some people, you know, like the undocumented migrant case, they have a very, very high utility value attached to their privacy, and then, you know, others don't. So, you know, does this help? Does this complicate your problem? Does this simplify your problem? This is a great question. So, it actually ties back to the thing that I said I hope somebody would ask me about also, where I said, suppose for now that people have well defined preferences of privacy. So, this result actually holds for any preferences in general. No matter what they are, it holds for every utility function you can think of over the unrestricted domain. Um, now, what this is kind of interesting, that means in terms of behavioral context, so where people do have different abilities to understand the information and different privacy concerns, is that this was the most ideal case where people know exactly what's going to happen to them in the future. They have that perfect utility function. And we showed 
that we kind of got an impossibility result here, which means because we're not in the best case, everything else is much worse in life. So this idea that we can social, uh, epsilon can be set with social outcomes in mind it is a neat idea, but we need to qualify that a little bit more. Whose social concerns, over what time period, so on and so forth. We're missing these qualitative words that specify down the problem. Uh, technical question. Sure. So you said if and on, only if. Yes. Uh, so, but you didn't tell us why uh, this is the only solution that satisfies those those four properties. So maybe you need a lot more time than what we have. Uh, yeah, can you uh, more give time us would be great. But, uh, <laughs> can you give us an intuition as to why, why sure. this is the only one? Yeah, so the intuition for why this is the only one is that truthfulness and anonymity, so anonymity tells us in this case that your mechanism has to depend on the number of votes. So the outcome is a function of the number of votes for each option. Because we impose truthfulness, we need to make sure that when people switch votes, the probability distribution here um, actually ends up moving exactly the same amount left to right, no matter how you switch. And because it does that, it, and the probability distribution for any epsilon value looks like the form y equals mx plus b. By truthfulness, m must be positive. Otherwise, you would have a better incentive to lie than tell the truth because it pushes you in the other direction. And the phantom values give you the slope intercept terms of set differential policy. And make sure that m is non-zero, it comes from non-degeneracy. Um, we'll have to uh, oh. continue with more questions later because we have to move on. To awesome. Thank you all. <laughs>
um, we took a curated literature review to explore the breadth and richness of how design practices are used in relation to privacy. Reading through a collection of 64 HCI conference papers that discuss both privacy and design, we use these papers to explore the questions, um, why is design used, who is design done by, and for whom is design done for? And today I'm gonna to focus on the kind of that why question, and happy to talk about the other aspects later. So what we kind of found and described through reading the HCI design and privacy work is that there were kind of four meta purposes of design. There was design used to solve a privacy problem, to inform or support privacy, um, to explore people and situations, and to critique, speculate, and present critical alternatives. Um, and I'll note in practice, these categories are not mutually exclusive and they're not the only way to kind of look at what design means, but looking at these separately helped us give some analytical clarity. And so I'll walk through each of these. Uh, first, design is seen as a way to solve a privacy problem, which occurred most often in the papers that I looked at. And I think that kind of colloquially, this is often how we think about design. We have a problem and we design something to solve that problem. Um, and so in privacy, like if we, design, if we define privacy as a set of harms due to data processing and aggregation, we might design a system that limits data retention to solve that. Or if we think about privacy as not being identified, we might design a system that uses pseudonymity or anonymity techniques like differential privacy. Um, but in all of these, privacy is presented as a problem that has been kind of well-defined at the beginning of the design process. And then a solution is used to, um, design is used to create a solution to that problem. The kind of second purpose that we found was that design was also seen as a way to inform or support actors who must make privacy relevant choices rather than solving the privacy problem outright. And this was also kind of a common occurrence in the readings and the research that we looked at. Um, and it fits in well with US regulations around privacy that kind of force individuals to manage and control their own data. So for example, a lot of research has been done on how to best design privacy notices or privacy policies and how to present them to users. But it's still up to the individual user of a service to read that privacy policy if they want to, um, and then to make a kind of privacy relevant decision. So one example is Kelly et al's work on alternate forms of privacy notices, like that kind of tabular form. Um, other types of design work in this vein includes designing privacy dashboards, privacy controls, visualizations for privacy, and designing kind of educational materials and activities all of which use design as a way to try to support and inform users so that they can take privacy-related actions. And kind of this orientation to design often implicitly sees problems of privacy as an informational problem in the, in the sense that it implicitly assumes that if users receive the like, right types of information presented in the right ways, then they will choose to act in more privacy-preserving ways. The third approach that we found was the use of design to explore people and situations. So notably here, it's not about solving an immediate problem, but it's using design as a way to better understand people and situations. Um, so things like probes and collaborative, de yeah, collaborative design activities are some approaches here. And so for example, I did a project where I presented booklets of these conceptual designs to interview participants. And these booklets had um, sketches and fictional advertisements for invasive sensing products, so things like implantable sensors and remote heartbeat monitors. And importantly, the goal of showing these designs to people is not about gathering feedback to make these products, or it's not about how to make these systems usable. Instead, the goal was to use these conceptual design ideas as a way to have a provocation to better understand participants about how, they're conceptually, how are they conceptualizing privacy when they see these designs? How do their reactions help us understand how they see and experience the world? And so design here is used as a mode of inquiry to better understand what privacy means to people in different situations. And then last was design to critique, speculate, or present critical alternatives. Um, this is also about using design in a way that's not solving a problem. Design here is not necessarily about exploring the world as it is, but trying to focus on how the world could be. Often this consists of creating conceptual designs that subvert expectations or provoke to create a space to surface, uh, critique, and discuss social values, such as privacy. Um, these help us discuss future worlds we might want to avoid or that we might want to strive towards. 
So Lindley and Colton's Game of Drones paper surfaces privacy concerns by postulating a world of drone use with a speculative regulatory framework, and they come up with these kind of enforcement notices, um, different types of controllers and infrastructures. But they do this to raise questions about what types of privacy concerns emerge from drone use, are these kind of gamification mechanisms that they postulate appropriate tools to address privacy, so design here is used to explore the problem space of privacy, kind of what concepts of privacy are at play in this scenario, what relationships amongst users, technologies, and regulations are implicated in this fictional world when someone says, I have a privacy concern. And by doing this exploration of the problem space of privacy, it also starts to help us ask, where do we want to assign responsibility for protecting privacy in the technology, in regulation, in market mechanisms, and so forth. So in summary, these are kind of four purposes of design that we identified in this paper. They're not discrete categories, but we can sort of arrange them from thinking about design as a solution on the left to design as a process of inquiry on the right. Um, right now, to the extent that design is discussed as a part of privacy by design, it mostly focuses on these more left side ones as design as a solution, which ver works very well if you already have clear definitions of privacy. However, if we're trying to do work where the concept of privacy is not as well known, then using design approaches that see design as a process of inquiry can be very useful for exploring the problem space of privacy. And this could be useful for thinking about how does privacy emerge differently in the experiences of marginalized users, or how might the introduction of new technologies and legal re regimes affect the practice of privacy. Um, and I want to underscore this as kind of a big tent approach. Privacy by design should continue to use design as a solution uh, practice, but you know, privacy by design would also benefit a lot by including design as a form of inquiry, which has largely been overlooked so far. And I'll just end by saying that design isn't going to be an answer for every issue related to privacy. All design solutions are in some sense partial, um, but by broadening how we think about design as a part of privacy by design as those are getting rolled out, we can help encourage more holistic reflections and discussions about privacy by thinking about um, connections amongst privacy, social, legal, and technical aspects. Thank you. These are interesting issues, but when you write your dissertation, how will you know when you've succeeded? <laughs> Right, um, so in some sense, this is uh, ground setting for some of the dissertation work that I'm doing. So a lot of the methods that I'm drawing on are from these kind of uh, critique, exploration types of methods of design. And part of what I'm trying to do here is say that um, a lot of people have not kind of looked at those methods for privacy yet. Thanks, Richmond. I think it's very interesting work. Um, I, I think we're so often put in the position of asking to solve problems and sort of teleological design follows, and I'm glad you're leaving the, the left hand out. But I just wanted to ask you to clarify a bit on the right hand end. Again, when we're exploring or when we're critiquing, on whose behalf are we doing that? Right. Is, that is this for us, the organization, so we know more about users, or is it so for the user so they know more about us as the organization? to say it's a necessary binary, right. but I've just a little... Yeah, um, both, I think. So, I mean, one of the other things that I looked at that I didn't get time to discuss is kind of who does design and on whose behalf. And I think um, how it's currently practiced is often kind of design, what I call design authorities, so like, you know, designers and engineers trying to do this work on behalf of end users. Um, but there are a range of these kind of like participatory techniques that I think could be very useful to have to kind of empower stakeholders and users to do some of that design work kind of for themselves as well. Some more questions? We have time for one more. All right, thanks.
I'm Nora, a PhD student. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you for telling me. Can we do that? Uh, no, I need to unmirror. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, I'm Nora, a PhD candidate here at the School of Information, advised by Kamiko Ryokai, also a member of the Biosense Lab. Today, I'd like to talk with you about a more emotional side of data, designing with data for emotional experiences, interpretation, and affirmation, and how data can shape the way we relate to ourselves, our bodies, and others. A quick rundown of the talk. First, I'll introduce what is emotional biosensory data. Next, I'll motivate why we need to be exploring critical alternatives to the emotional biosensory data, echoing Richmond's call for exploring critical alternatives with privacy. Then a quick summary of some of my prior work where I have been exploring some critical alternatives to the emotional biosensory data, looking at interpretations and experiences with this kind of data. Then how emotional biosensory data is being enrolled for envisions of the smart city, um, the also known Internet of Things connected city, and how that motivates some of my current work. And finally, getting to my current work on the Heart Sounds Bench, which leverages biosensory data for an experience of affirmation. So what even is emotional biosensory data? Um, it's kind of a vague term, but people can wear sensors on their bodies, such as in a wristband or waistband. Um, sensors can be hidden in walls and sense people remotely. They measure things like heart rate, skin conductance, brain waves, breathing, video of facial expression, posture or gait, audio of voices, the list goes on. There are various algorithms that try to use this data to gain some idea of a person's mood, feelings, or even their mental state or intentions. For example, um, you know, video of the face could be used to detect smiling. A sudden increase in heart rate might indicate fear or positive excitement. There are a lot of different ways of doing this and plenty of open questions about what it might mean, so hence the big question mark. So what's wrong with the status quo here? Why not just use these sensors and algorithms to get some nice data-driven insights and call it a day? Well, it's almost five o'clock, so I understand some of us might need to call it a day soon, but let me try to convince you why we need to be exploring critical alternatives um, and a broad range of alternatives with emotional biosensory data. Um, these sensors, data, and algorithms are being enrolled to ask very old, very human questions about our lives and making our lives meaningful. Even something that might initially seem pretty straightforward or neutral, like counting the number of steps, is actually embroiled in a much bigger picture. It's related to how much I walk today. Um, it's kind of about if I got enough exercise. Short answer, no. It's also getting at questions of if I feel like I'm healthy or normal, or if I'm living my best life, as all the startups and self-help magazines are phrasing it these days. Um, as you can see, I may be a little bit cynical about um, our current moment's obsession with wellness, but more broadly, these questions of how we want to live our lives and whether we feel like we're living it the way we want to, these are really important questions. Similarly, with emotional biosensing, it's often used to place emotions into a few discrete categories that might seem at first to be neutral and to transcend culture and context. Um, it's often backed up by really tidy, well-done experimental results, but when we start to look at how these data-driven insights are getting applied in daily life for personal wellness, as several companies and consumer products do, we come across complex and important questions again about how we want to be living our lives. These systems embed ideas of how we should be feeling, what counts as a normal range of emotion. Just thinking about sensors, data, and algorithms here is not enough. Um, the humans have kind of gotten pushed to the side in this approach. We need more humanistic approaches to understand how people make meaning with emotional biosensory data. So in my work, I use design and qualitative research to understand how people experience and interpret emotional biosensory data and explore alternatives by designing and building biosensing technology. My prior work looks at fostering open-ended emotional interpretation with highly ambiguous, tangible data displays. Along with collaborators, I've worked on fabric that gently and gradually shifts colors in response to data in real time. I've also worked on detecting laughter from conversation and representing that as lights, chocolates, or keepsake sound bites in delicate bottles. I've also embedded sensors in shirts with embroidered color-changing display elements that respond to emotional biosensory data in daily life and asked pairs of friends to wear these around and reflect on their feelings. 
Finally, I tried to take a step back and reflect on some of this work in a broader context and charted out some key conceptual moves and generative new design directions in a recent paper aptly titled Emotional Biosensing, Exploring Critical Alternatives. Okay, so from this prior work, I kind of started to get a handle on how we can have very tangible, embodied, emotional experiences with data, interpreting data and ways of knowing with data. These are, in some sense, cutting edge, real-time data displays, but people aren't looking at a time series graph trying to find patterns. They're touching soft, hand-woven silk between their fingers. They're looking at a chocolate bar graph and remembering a conversation on the phone with their dad where they were both laughing. Or they're noticing their friend's shirt and asking them how they're feeling and having a conversation. So that's some of my prior work. Now let's get into my current project. For my current project, I'm asking some similar questions about how to foster emotional meaning making, both individually and socially, but in a somewhat different context of the smart city. So what are smart cities, and how are they using emotional biosensory data? Smart cities are kind of vision about how we can incorporate more sensors and Internet of Things devices into cities to make them more efficient and safer, among other goals. Um, Sensors and data and algorithms are again being enrolled to answer these very old and very human questions about what we want cities to be like and what we want the experience of living in cities to feel like. Here's one example of using sensors to make spaces safer. Uh, Nightscope is a company that makes robots to patrol parking lots, malls, and sometimes public space using sensors and algorithms to detect anomalies and report suspicious activity to security teams. They were briefly deployed by the SPCA in San Francisco to deter homeless people from existing on the nearby sidewalks until the city made them take them out of public space. So I, there's a lot of ways we could poke at this. I mean, what counts as an anomaly in public space? Why are we assuming anomalies are bad? Just take a walk on Berkeley's campus and tell me if you notice anything unusual. <laughs> I mean, really, are only the normies allowed to stay? Um, so, uh, Nightscope's picture is, is not a very welcoming vision for public space. I want public space to feel more like this. Someone made a bench into the rocks in their yard. You can just sit a while for free. Don't have to pay any money. You don't have to give up any data. Um, you don't have to be productive either. Just take a breather. How might emotional biosensory data support this more peaceful and supportive experience of city living? With all that in mind, I designed the Heart Sounds Bench. It amplifies the heart sounds of bench sitters and invites a peaceful moment of rest and listening. The setup's pretty simple. Um, my background's in engineering. Happy to talk shop later. We're short on time. Let's move on. Here are two people experiencing the bench for the first time. If I can pull up the demo video. So it's pretty slow um, demo video, but they hadn't experienced it before. Um, I conducted a pilot study where pairs of strangers experienced the bench indoors um, while looking out onto the campus through some windows. They reflected on feeling connected to a shared sense of being alive. Here, Sally's reflecting on how it's a reminder of what's pulsing through everybody. And she thought, it just seems really sweet to me to hear that, to hear somebody else's, the life pulsing through them. So although it's factually obvious that Sally and her partner are both alive, um, affirming that, so we're not really learning like some key insight here, but affirming that through this experience of listening to the heart sounds seemed to be a compelling experience. Um, and not only the two study partners, but Sally is more broadly thinking about what's pulsing through everybody. She's appreciating that other people are alive too. Um, so if we look back, this stands in sharp contrast to that other vision of security guard robots patrolling against anomalies. Instead of that empty plaza um, patrolled by robots, the Heart Sounds bench engages a different vision of appreciating that throbbing energy of a vibrant, crowded city street or a quiet, inviting bench corner. So to be clear, the Heart Sounds bench doesn't directly solve problems. I'm not advocating that San Francisco install a bunch of these. What the Heart Sounds bench does is suggest a different way of engaging sensors and data in public space and a different purpose and a different way of knowing and experiencing with data. Um, next steps are a long-term outdoor public deployment and an art opening next week with a related project. Um, I encourage you to come check it out. 
And finally, so many thanks are due. Um, design doesn't happen in a vacuum, and this idea of designing for affirmation was largely inspired by the many people around me providing support and affirmation. Um, and thank you all for coming and listening, and happy to take questions. One aspect of engagement is, is say, provocation and, and, and reaction back. Have, have you, in, in the limited deployment or, or in the full deployment, do you expect any opportunities for hacking in, in some sense, either good hacking or, or nasty hacking? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm kind of excited to see, you know, if, if people, some people might like it, some people might dislike it. And so going into a uh, public space, that's what I like about deploying things in daily life. I can never predict what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it was vandalized, but I would just kind of understand. Uh, yeah. And it could be, it could be a good thing too. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of fun, playful uses. It's essentially a feedback instrument. You can use it to play music. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm wondering, as wearables get more commonplace, um, have you considered ways to to kind of connect people either who are you know wearing things together or who are remote? But you know, there's a whole community of people out there that are probably wearing wearables right this instant. Um, have you thought about ways to, to kind of tap into that as this number grows? Uh, yeah, there are a number of projects that work to um, particularly um, long distance family members or long distance couples to help them feel more connected through the design of these tangible um, sensing and actuating devices. I think that's a really interesting space to work in. Um, I think I just kind of got interested in how we share space with strangers, physically co-present strangers in public space and how that's both like we kind of have this social contract of politely ignoring each other because I can't talk to everyone on BART, you know, I don't really want to. Um, but at the same time, you know, appreciating that sharing space. So that's kind of the space I was looking at. But definitely, yeah, there's, I'd love to talk with you more. A lot of projects happening there. Nora, thank you. That was really fascinating. And I apologize for having the comment question. No, but I noticed that the heart sounds bench, it really brings out the viscerality of the body to people. And the, um, the affirmation comment you had spoke to that. And I think we often think of technology maybe wrongly as trying to kind of sanitize things or cover up for the viscerality of the body. So I'm just wondering if that's something you were thinking about here, of sort of trying to return to an animalistic sense of the physical self. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Thank you for noticing that and commenting. Um, there are a number of projects that sense pulse and use that to as the tempo for a predefined haptic or uh, sonic pattern of like ba bump, ba bump. But it's really just the same ba bump, but at different speeds depending on your pulse. So I really liked the stethoscopes, even though they're a little awkward and crunchy sounding, because it is much more like that body embodied rich sound. I mean, if you burp, it picks up on that too. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know. We'll have to continue the conversation uh, at the receptions, but as well on to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you, thanks. Nora. <laughs> speaker notes. <coughs> All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Max. I'm a PhD candidate here. I think I just hit the mic. Um, I think I know most of you in the room, but uh, I also worked with uh, some collaborators on this project I'm about to discuss uh, called Understanding Digitally, Digitally Mediated Empathy, um, an exploration of visual, narrative, and biosensory informational cues. And my collaborators on this project, two um, high school students, Jeremy Gordon. I don't know if he's in the audience somewhere. Oh, there he is, yeah. Um, and Lily Lin, who's a MIMS student here, and then we had a visiting student last year, Priya, um, and John Chuang, our advisor. 
I'm gonna start with some motivation and background for this work. Um, luckily, Nora did a lot of the scaffolding for me, so I can maybe rely on that. Um, but we communicate through technology all the time, and there's a lot of clear reasons why we might do this. Uh, chiefly among them, um, as one of the questions just pointed out, um, it eliminates the requirement of co-location. We can talk to someone and express ourselves um, to someone that's not immediately in the room with us. It also can ease one-to-many communication, um, and you have a lot of more increased control over self-presentation. For example, you can be anonymous in online communication, which is very difficult to do in a face-to-face -face scenario. Um, often this comes at the, there's great advantages to, to talking, uh, communicating through, to, through technology but often comes at a cost of uh, reduced cues or channels to understand how someone might be feeling when they're trying to express themselves to us um, over a mediated channel. Um, like this communication can take many forms, you know, for example, text, emojis, video, uh, links. Um, there's social VR as an up and coming um, way to communicate through technology. Um, and two, an interesting example I find that relates to this work in particular is this practice of streaming. Um, and particularly like when a gamer is streaming what they're doing down in the bottom right, um, and they have like their face right there in the corner. You can see how they're reacting and how they're thinking about what they're doing. Similarly, there are videos out there of like reactions to trailers, um, and those are kind of efforts to get back some of those cues um, that are often lost in uh, these sorts of communication. Um, these are pretty safe examples, except maybe that middle one there. Um, but there's some concern that many of us might have about growing social division and the role of technology in that the role technology has in this process. Um, for example, social networking sites, um, and. Relatedly, meta-analyses of historical trends suggest that levels of empathy in the US may be at an all-time low. Um, all, or not all-time, but a low. <laughs> uh, I'll talk more about empathy in a second. Um, luckily, Nora talked about social biosensing already, but uh, biosensing, if you've forgotten in a couple of minutes, um, is a capture and interpretation of physiological data from our bodies or behaviors. Um, it includes things like heart rate. It also includes electrodermal activity, also called skin conductance. I'm gonna call it EDA. Um, that's small changes in the moisture of your skin, and it's often related to emotional arousal. Um, could be positive or negative, like excitement or fear. Social biosensing is the practice of taking these uh, data types and sharing them with one another. Um, it's an active area of research inspired by, and I was personally inspired by many of these studies um, that already existed before I did this one, um, with a lot of interesting findings around closeness, intimacy, expressivity, these different signals. Um, and some of these projects, in particular Nora's in the middle here, uh, their 2016 work on uh, color changing fabric, um, take advantage of the ambiguity, as Nora mentioned, um, in these signals, um, and particularly to encourage affect as interaction rather than information. Um, so a recent push against labeling what someone might be feeling with a, a obvious word like happy or sad, instead engaging the person in interpreting what that person might, the other person might be feeling. Um, and to me, uh, what I thought, I thought was a really interesting angle that no one had taken here yet was um, relating this to empathy. And um, particularly to complement the qualitative work in this area existing, I wanted to take a more experimental approach that engaged with concepts of empathy. What do I mean when I say empathy? It's a long studied uh, topic. I'm not gonna get into all of it here. I haven't gotten into all of it myself, you know, ever. <laughs> um, but the definition I'll use here is the understanding and responding to the emotional and mental states of others. Um, there are two primary components to empathy that people have come up with or over the years. One is cognitive, which is cognitive empathy, which is the perception of the, the mental states of another. Um, that's the primary focus of this study. There's also an affective component, which is like feeling the emotions of someone else. So there's recognition in the cog cognitive and the feeling of it in the affective. Um, and recent research in empathy has revealed and, and suggested that empathy is a motivated process. It's not simply that some people are better at empathizing than others, but that there's a lot of um, reasons we might choose to empathize more or less, or strategies we might use to increase or decrease empathy. Let's move on to the current study and the methods and design here. Start with some research questions. My first research question going into this was, how do different types of informational cues about an anonymous target um, affect observers' accuracy rating the target's uh, state and observers' uh, feel empathy toward the target. So the target here is the person who has an experience and is sharing it, and the observers are the person receiving that information and trying to make sense of what they're feeling. Um, this first question here was addressed more quantitatively in the experiment, so I had some hypotheses. I predicted that narration, I, I had three forms of information um, that I'll discuss in a minute, but I predicted that uh, narration would be kind of the result in the most accuracy and the most empathy, because um, you have a lot of uh, flexibility and power in, in describing how you're feeling. Um, followed by something like EDA, a biosignal, that has some more information than nothing, but it's confusing and more difficult to interpret than narration. Um, followed by a control condition where you don't get any extra information at all. Um, and the second research question is, what are observers' qualitative impressions of different informational cues, and how do they describe their strategies for empathizing with a target? That one was addressed more qualitatively with a set of interviews that I'll discuss at the end. 
So as I mentioned, I wanted to study empathy more experimentally. Um, so there's this target and the observer. Um, the first phase of the study involved gathering the data from the target's experience to then share with observers. So what we did was um, the, the target, a given person, was put into an uh, immersive VR experience. Um, and this VR experience is a short film called Pearl. It's about five minutes long. Um, it's an animated short about a girl and her dad who crisscrossed the country in a hatch, uh, hatchback car, um, chasing their dreams is the, the tagline. Um, and so during, basically we put this person in the VR experience and during that experience we collected um, their, their EDA um, as well as recording what they were looking at in a field of view. And then uh, we replayed that video for them and they kind of narrated how they were feeling throughout it um, after they just had experienced the, the video. And then finally, again, we had them watch the 2D version, this recorded video, and provide ratings of how they were feeling on a scale from very negative to very positive. Um, and I'll get into that task again because it gets repeated in the next part. But basically, we use all this information we collected to produce stimuli to show to observers. So what do these stimuli look like? Um, I'm not gonna show the video here, maybe we can later, but there are three conditions. So like I mentioned, there's the narration condition where we took the narration the, uh, the target provided and uh, made it into subtitles. Field of view, where it was kind of just a control condition in the middle, and then uh, <laughs> EDA, which was where there's an animated graph of the target's EDA along the bottom of the, the screen. So in the observer phase, which is, you can ignore the top one, but the lower one we're talking about now, we showed this, these different stimuli to um, different observers in uh, three different conditions. And so um, basically what they did was watch that video, whichever stimuli they were given, and had to predict how the, um, they thought the observer was feeling on that same scale from negative to positive. It looked kind of like this. They had a laptop in front of them and a dial that they would use to change it throughout the video. And then we did some uh, post-task uh, questions as well, asking about um, how much did they feel like they were in the observer's shoes, and also um, did these semi-structured interviews with each observer, asking questions like what were their general impressions of the, of the task they were asked to do, how did they split their attention between um, the different pieces of information they're receiving, et cetera. What do we find? So this uh, three panel plot on the left is showing the uh, time series of the uh, target's ratings alongside the observer's ratings in the three conditions. So that uh, kind of more spiky gray line in, in the back of all three of these is the target's self ratings of how they were feeling. And laid on top of that are the, the mean ratings of the observers, the 20 observers in those conditions. So uh, a couple things to notice from this plot. Um, people were pretty accurate overall. It's likely due to the narrative uh, form of, this, of the video that the person was watching. Um, but there's some differences here. So the EDA condition and the field of view condition, the bottom two, kind of avoid the extremes of the scale. Um, people were probably less confident or perhaps were second guessing their, uh, their ratings, which we'll get into in the interviews. Um, and then the figure on the right here is kind of collapsing the data across in, into um, an accuracy measure. So EA stands for empathic accuracy, and that's the correlation between the observer's ratings and the target's ratings. Um, and so we found a significant difference here that the EDA condition actually performed worse than the field of view by itself. So adding the EDA information worsened accuracy, um, contrary to the hypothesis that you know, EDA would outperform the control. Um, but in line with the hypothesis, the narration did perform the best. That provided the most uh, information for people to accurately predict how the target was feeling. Some of the post-task measures, we didn't find any differences in these, but um, that question about how much did you feel like you were in the, uh, the target's shoes, um, we didn't see any differences between groups, likely because there's a kind of a ceiling effect happening. Watching a video of someone's uh, field, first person perspective is already pretty much in, that, in line with that. Um, so I'm gonna adjust those kind of questions for future work. Um, we also didn't see differences in task difficulty or confidence in their ratings um, or their like, overall emotion ratings of the target. Um, that was a separate question, not the rating, the rating task. And then I'm gonna just go over one interview theme that we found um, that I was most excited about. So this was um, coming back to a concept in empathy called mind perception, which is more of the cognitive component of empathy. But it's the idea that you can, um, that you recognize someone else as a person who has their own feelings and thoughts, um, and that's kind of a precursor to being able to empathize with them at all. So in both the narration and EDA conditions, um, the observers in the interviews talked about this process. So someone in the narration condition said, I couldn't let my feelings get in the way, and I had to look at it from what I was reading about how the narrator felt. And also similarly in the EDA condition, someone said, sometimes I felt like there were some spikes where I thought there shouldn't be. Maybe it was because the viewer was a parent and maybe they wouldn't know some things that kids don't, or they would know things kids don't. Maybe that's why. Um, so both of these cases, interestingly, both of these types of cues function to have this humanizing effect. 
lots of limitations to this research. Uh, there's scope limitations for sure. We do this in a controlled laboratory setting um, with a young adult, undergraduate and graduate student population. Um, we only had a single empathy target, and so um, uh, that's not the, the purpose of this study was to kind of see what happened with the observers, um, but different people might have different levels of expressivity verbally or narration, for example, um, or different responses in their EDA, which could limit um, the usage of those different cues. And of course, the oper operationalization of empathy here was a single dimension of valence um, and about accuracy, which is a highly specific component of a pretty complex uh, uh, topic of, of empathy. Stay tuned for future work. I'm gonna try to hone in on some of the humanization and mind perception effects I saw, adding some measures for that in future work. Um, and especially like what I'd like to do in future work is explore non-anonymous contexts. So within, an, uh, between groups, for example, is where a lot of important empathic interactions might happen. And um, I think that's, that'll be an important next step for this research. Um, other things I'll also talk about later. And I think we don't have time for a conclusion, but I'll just open up to questions and maybe I'll conclude during that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Really cool stuff. Um, Thanks. One thing that wasn't quite clear to me is, is the VR setting like integral to answering this question about like mediated empathy or is that just sort of a convenience because you can have a controlled environment? Yeah. And if it was just a convenience, could you speak to like the extent to which you think the findings would translate to like real world experiences? Yeah, there were two primary reasons why the experience was a virtual reality. One was um, that it was a a close-ish approximation to kind of recording something. Say you're at a concert and you're recording a video, kind of that first-person field of view in someone's experience that someone might share online. Um, another reason was that we thought it would, versus just watching a video, that it could, it could um, uh, elicit more emotional responses, um, and uh, both in the EDA and the narration piece. Um, but yeah, it's a really good point that this is a pretty highly controlled environment. Um, and I would be really curious to see how it would work out in, you know, IRL. <laughs> um, something I'd like to explore in the future for sure. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> Can you talk a bit more about the motivation behind showing the raw, uh, raw um, EDA graphs? Yeah. Um, it feels very clinical, and people are not used to seeing that in real time as they yeah. experience. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so part of the reason why it was a raw graph was um, previous work has shown, there's particular work by uh, Lou et al, 2018, this past year at CSCW, um, where she kind of compared the expressivity of different um, representations of biosensory information. And she found that the, the people kind of interpreting it actually wanted the more raw forms to be able to have more of an interpretation, rather than on the other end of that spectrum is like emojis, like a smiley face, a sad face, those sorts of things. Um, that was one piece, and then also, um, I, I do agree that, I, and especially because this project was more about cognitive uh, empathy, the cognitive empathy component, um, and that, that kind of clinical sense well, it does feel like it fits more into that cognitive component. I'm really curious in the future studies to explore um, representing the data in maybe a more physical way, and in which case I could include uh, measures of affective empathy. Like perhaps if we felt a vibration as that goes up and down rather than watching the graph, it might um, uh, encourage more um, like feeling of what that person is feeling, or um, maybe just have a different channel where it's not, you're watching it and trying to see the graph in the same, both in visual uh, channel. So yeah, definitely agree that it was a limitation here, but I'm glad that we picked, we started with something raw to see what would happen with. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I was just thinking about um, emotion in general, how, how it's collected, and I've seen a lot of research uh, done on speech and, and also images. Uh, for, more from like engineering standpoint, but uh, what role did speech play for if it was applicable at all, and um, how do you see it in, in, in a future research maybe? Yeah, um, so I didn't use speech here because it kind of compromises the anonymity question. You can assume a lot about a person based on their voice, but there's really interesting work, especially with this humanization piece, that's, that the voice especially is a really powerful channel or signal that um, indicates that someone is, has a capacity of a person just like you or that they have feelings and thoughts of their own. Um, there's some interesting work in psych about that. So yeah, I like that idea a lot. And one participant even said, we asked like, what other cues might you want um, to, to see or to use to predict information? And one participant talked about at a movie theater when you hear people gasp or you hear laughs, like there's certain even just breath sounds that can reveal a lot about emotion. Um, yeah, it gets away from the an an anonymous piece, which is why it wasn't included here but uh, definitely a, an interesting channel to explore. 
Yeah. 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 It just the uh, it just reveals certain things about the person. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thanks. Um, sorry, we up. are at time, <laughs> um, so we'll have to save those questions for later. But um, thank you, Max. Yeah. Thank you all. So my name is uh, John Gillick. I am, like everyone else, a PhD student here in the School of Information. And today I would like to talk to you about drums. Um, probably the only one who's going to talk about drums, so thanks for uh, humoring me. So uh, I should say that I started this project when I was uh, an intern with a team at Google last summer called Magenta. And I, so some of my collaborators are there. And then I've continued it uh, since I came back to campus last semester. So um, this work is very much inspired by my background and interest in music production. So this is um, everything that goes into making a, a recorded piece of music. And for, um, for people who are not familiar, I think we might imagine that when you hear a song, it came into being with a bunch of people sitting together in a room with their instruments and playing at the same time. And so while this is still the case in some cases, in some styles, um, there are many other styles where there's at least some component of um, computer creation involved. So somebody is sitting at a digital interface, editing, um, sketching ideas in non-real time. So I want to attempt to give you all a very quick insight into what it actually looks like to work in one of these situations. So this is a uh, program called Logic, which is made by Apple. And so here I made this, uh, if you look at the, the bottom of the screen where we have all these little blocks, this is the editor that I'm faced with when I'm making a drum beat in software. So I can move the notes around, I can make them louder or quieter, which is visualized by the color of the notes. And um, I thought it would be a fun uh, example to choose the, the number one hit song from the uh, charts yesterday, which is uh, Thank You Next by Ariana Grande. So I created the drum beat from this song um, in this program, and I'm going to play, play it for you just uh, repeated over a couple measures, and then I'll fade in the actual track so you can hear how it, how it kind of fits. Cool, great song. Um, <laughs> So the, the producer of this song almost certainly created the, the drum beat in a, a setting like this. So um, yeah, I think these, these tools are amazing, what we can do with them. And um, I just want to address in this project a couple challenges that uh, we're faced with when working in this, this kind of context and how we might uh, be able to, to provide new options for creating different sounds. So first, it's very, it's very time consuming to create um, the expressiveness of a performance by hand in an editor like this. So those, those beats that you saw, they, they're a bit rigid. They're very fixed to the timeline. So it doesn't sound quite the same as it does when a, when a, a person is actually playing a drum set. So, um, but in reality, humans are very attuned to sounds that sound like they're made by a person. And so we, we connect with them in a different way sometimes. This is not uh, necessarily better or worse. It's just um, an existing limitation of working in this kind of way. Um, so um, in this project, we, we try to answer some of these questions. So first, we really want to know, can we model uh, the performance aspects of, uh, of drums with machine learning? This might be a way to allow people um, new kinds of interfaces to create uh, expressive sounding drums without actually playing them themselves. So we want to know kind of which methods, what data might you need. I don't really have time to talk about the methods in, uh, in this talk, but basically we use uh, models similar to what, what we use for uh, machine translation. Um, and then lastly, I want to know, um, can, we, can we give these models to people in actual practical settings and do they find them useful? Do they, do they think they're inspiring or fun? Or are they scary? Do they make, make them angry? So 
we so far have, I think, reasonable answers for the first two questions and are just starting to think about the third. Um, so another way of getting uh, drum performances into this software setting is to use an interface like this one, which is an electronic drum kit. And you can actually uh, set the drums up like a real acoustic drum set, but they're outfitted with sensors. So when you hit a pad, it will trigger a sound that has been pre-recorded. And we can record these things and capture a lot of the precise dynamics of how hard they hit it and exactly when they hit it. So I'm going to just play a quick uh, sample of what this sounds like. So I know that was really short, but hopefully you can hear that there's some imperfection to it. The, the notes are different volumes. Sometimes they're a little bit late or early. And it's hard to describe what exactly it is about it that is human, but I think we can immediately recognize it when we hear it. So what, what, we, what we tried to do is um, having this data in a, a form that we can work with, we can try to break down what a drum performance is into some different components. So two things that we looked at are what we call the score and then what we call the groove. So the score visualized in these green notes specifies exactly which, exactly which notes to be played, but it doesn't say how to play them. So this is what you get with Western notation um, in particular. And the groove um, visualized on the other side basically shows the way in which it's played. And we can actually listen to examples of how, 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 of how each of these things sound if we uh, remove some of the information from a performance. So first, let me play the score. This is uh, basically rendered by the program without any variation in timing or velocity. So that's a little bit robotic. And then we have the groove. So if we have the performance from a person, we can actually extract one or the other of these. And taken together, they create the whole thing. So drummers are really good at taking one of these and generating the other. If you hand a drummer a piece of music, they can, they can perform that music, and they'll do it in a style that makes sense to them. And if you imply a groove to them by playing something on another instrument or maybe tapping a rhythm, um, they'll be able to choose a reasonable sequence of drum hits to perform that groove on the drum set. So um, what we did is build machine learning models that take one of those things or the other and generate the, the whole thing. Um, so yeah, here's a, a visualization of what the model is. Basically, we have the first one, which we call humanize, different meaning of Max's humanize or groove. So we go from the score to the performance. Or this other one, we've changed names a few times. Right now, I'm going with Drumify, which goes from a groove to a performance. So um, we collected a bunch of data. We recorded drummers playing these drum kits. Looks like that, or like this. And uh, in the time I have left, I just want to give you a quick demonstration of what it actually sounds like when you have these things and you can uh, use them in practice. So uh, a couple of people from that, that team I was working with at Google implemented an interface for these models that actually plugs into another uh, professional software. So here I'm going to play uh, the input drum beat, which is kind of this rigid thing. And then we'll, we'll hear what it sounds like when you uh, put it through the model. So this is the input. So hopefully you can hear a little bit of difference. I'm going to play along with the bass. Maybe you can feel the groove a little more with the bass. Cool. And then I want to play uh, the other example. So in this case, we're actually picking up on the groove that a person uh, performs into it. So I'm going to play a little bit of a uh, piano. And then the model is going to pick up on the groove of the piano and generate drums that uh, fit that groove. So this is kind of a jazzy thing. And an interesting thing to notice is that it's actually able to pick, on, pick up on aspects like genre just through the, through the groove. So it's going to play back something jazzy. Just showing how the interface works. And then one more example where we give it a bass line.
Um, so I'm just going to leave you all with, with a few questions for the future. So I think what's interesting about this um, is uh, immediately for me is how people actually respond in practice if you use these things. Um, so uh, you know, professionals or amateurs, how does it affect their process? How do they feel about using it? And then an important part of this process is actually collecting uh, the data set, so recording the drummers. And I think for a lot of work in machine learning, there are uh, found data sets that people use. So like there's a lot of pictures of cats on the internet and you can build models that will generate new cats that are even cuter. Um, <laughs> but if you have a more specific application like drumming, you might need to build a new data set. And so what is it, how should we do that? Who should we uh, collaborate with? And what does it mean for, for all the people involved? Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you. Oh, that was quite impressive, uh, the work you did, actually. You, I mean, we are um, not perfect, so you can always hear the difference, um, obviously. But my quick question is, um, uh, when you were recording those, these drum sets, did, did style play into, um, style of drumming play into the uh, learning models that you were creating, or they were different, or it was just all uh, one general mix of everything? Yeah, so the examples I showed was actually a mix of a bunch of different styles that were all baked into the same model, but I experimented with um, a few different ways of, of applying a, a labeled style. So we intentionally got people who had different backgrounds, uh, who played different styles, were trained in different styles, and, and I asked them to each uh, label every time they did a recording to tell me what they would call that. So we have annotations for the data set with things like genre, and and we can, we can explore those. And, we haven't uh, spent as much time on those, but but you can definitely hear the difference. I think we might need different methods, actually, to, to do a better job with those different variations of models. Maybe this is more a, a socialization question, but the, I mean, the few bass, player I, bass players I've known consider that they own the groove. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I'm a bass player, so okay. I'm happy so, to give it up. So have you... Have you <laughs> Have, have you, in, in this context, talked to, you know, somebody pretty obvious, like like a bass player, who who would be in in tandem and in competition and with with a drummer? Yeah. So we haven't we haven't really got to explore how people are going to interact with these things yet. So far, we've really just been focused on making it work. But now that it works as well as it does, that that's really the next set of questions that that I want to ask, and that's a great one for sure. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I am going to have to ask everyone to hold their questions um, again one last time. Thanks, John. Unfortunately, there's no Ariana Grande in my dissertation talk, but um, um, so yeah, I, I just finished my PhD and my dissertation was challenge, uh, titled Challenging the Dominant Narratives of a Digital Financial Inclusion. Um, so just to start off, I want to talk a little bit about what financial inclusion is, or rather what the shorthand for financial inclusion has come to mean, especially in the international aid sector. Um, so this is from the CGAP website. Uh, it's a World Bank affiliated uh, you know, group that works with trying to tackle poverty. So they say that financial inclusion means that formal financial services, such as deposit and savings accounts, et cetera, are readily available to consumers and that they're actively and effectively using these services to meet their specific needs. Um, 
what this essentially means, what the simplistic and sort of measurable outcome of this definition has come to mean is ownership of formal bank accounts, right? So if you have access to a formal bank account, you are financially included. Um, where does technology fit into this? So what has happened is that financial inclusion is more of a conversation in emerging economies where people tend to be not very banked, right? They don't have access to bank accounts as much as they do in the global north here. Um, so in these countries, on this part of the world, actually everywhere now, mobile phones are ubiquitous. So what has been happening for the last decade is that, or a little over a decade, is that ever since M-Pesa, a mobile banking application that was uh, you know, piloted and launched in Kenya, uh, there's been a lot of excitement around mobile banking in this space because now, or actually when M-Pesa was launched, people who had never had bank accounts could use their mobile application to do these routine financial transactions, right? So it was this big revolution. People were really excite, uh, excited. Um, and PESA till today is very successful and it's kind of perpetuated and maintained this momentum in the international aid sector. Um, so what a lot of the impetus around this in the international aid sector is, is that people are trying to digitize different forms of financial services, right? So this is just sort of the headline from the Digital Financial Services page from the Gates Foundation website. Uh, and this pretty much encapsulates what I'm talking about, right? It talks about how in the past six years, 1.2 billion people have gained access to banks and mobile money accounts. And this revolution in financial inclusion has the potential to offer a pathway out of poverty for millions of people. So suddenly access to bank accounts and access to mobile banking accounts can help you not be poor anymore, right? So therefore, financial inclusion has pretty much led to the emergence of a hazardous concept, and this is my ode to sort of Leo Marx's uh, paper on technology as a hazardous concept, right? Because I'm sort of implicating some of the analogous discursive hazards around financial inclusion. Um, in the international aid sector, at least, the financial inclusion paradigm, it pivots on this term inclusion, which um, is seldom used in a negative sense, right? Um, basically, it has all these powerful connotations of harmony and welfare and enfranchisement, right? So generally, not just financial inclusion, but anybody who's doing any kind of interventions in international aid, when they're talking about inclusion, they're talking about the bringing in of individuals and households and communities into a superior system, exclusion from which would be not desirable. So with that, Financial inclusion has sort of become a central trope in international development, um, and it's kind of been established as this global moral imperative, right? That without it, you will not be, um, or you will not be able to climb out of poverty. So that is pretty much what I'm trying to challenge in my dissertation, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so I've given, by the way, a lot more background and historical an analysis of all of this in my dissertation because of time, I'm not getting into that. Um, before I talk about how I challenge this, you know, some of these narratives, I want to talk about poverty itself, right? Because financial inclusion is supposed to be solving the problem of poverty. So the financial inclusion agenda is pretty much casting poverty as a problem of a lack of capital. Um, it's formatting the life of the materially poor, poor as only financial lives, um, which is legitimizing these financial inclusion interventions that are happening in its name, right? And therefore, there is this financialization of poverty that's happening that's leading to these development interventions becoming financialized as well um, in a bid to sort of solve what is, what is considered to be the defining condition of poverty. And now, with mobile banking being a part of the conversation as well, a lot of it is also about these people, their lives being formatted as technology lives, right? Um, so the problem with this is that poverty is not, though, just a problem of lack of capital, right? It's a structural and a political problem that leads to an unjust and unequal distribution of resources across society. So what essentially ends up happening is that when we're talking about financial inclusion in this sense, um, we are not giving adequate uh, you know, attention to sort of structural changes that need to happen to actually solve the problems of poverty. Um, so I'm certainly not the first person who's been thinking about challenging these narratives. There's been some work that's been going on, and I wanted to quickly point to a little bit of that. 
So part of, I mean, the first thing that people talk about or scholars talk about is just the inclusion-exclusion dichotomy, right? Um, there's this homogenizing narrative of financial inclusion which misses the advantages of exclusion or the perils of inclusion. Um, for instance, Jenna, you know, my advisor, she sort of talks about how being included brings low-income populations into relationships with monolithic banking institutions uh, where you have to navigate these long queues and red, ta red tape significantly, uh, which diminishes their uses, right? So in my own research, when I've spoken to people, it turns out that their interactions um, with formal banks, and I'm talking about sort of low-income, low-literate users, uh, underbanked users, their interactions with these banks have been at best awkward and at worst exploitative, right? Because sometimes they just don't have the necessary resources or the skills or the information to navigate these banking systems. Um, the poor, or the so-called repressed entrepreneurs, which is talked about a lot in microfinance, they're often pushed into these entrepreneurial ventures, um, even if they don't have the skills or the technologies to actually you know, set up their, you know, their own startups, so as to speak. So this actually led to the microfinance crisis a little bit, right? Because the whole um, idea of microfinance was like, let's give money to people so that they can do their own business and they can be successful, right? But what if they can't manage their businesses successfully, right? So that is sort of you know, pointing to the perils of inclusion. And then Marcus Taylor sort of observes that the notion that the unbanked are necessarily excluded excluded is disingenuous because actually a lot of people are comprehensively included in informal financial, uh, informal finance, right? Um, I'm talking about things like relying on your friends and family, savings groups, Roscars, you know, there are a host of, you know, uh, financial uh, products and tools out there that can help people include themselves, so as to speak. Then there's also the, you know, this formal informal dichotomy, right, which more and more scholars now are saying is should actually be considered as a spectrum because this dichotomy is actually just a false dichotomy. Because eventually everyone, not just the poor, but even us, we're not just doing one form of finance or the other, right? We're doing um, a plurality. We are performing you know, both at the same time. So the lines between them start to get blurred. Um, with that, I'll talk a little bit about the data I collected and what, you know, how I made sense of that. So I mostly collected ethnographic, actually I collected only ethnographic data uh, in Kampala and Uganda and in Delhi and Bangalore and India. And I basically have three chapters dedicated to each one of these sort of you know, uh, findings, broad findings. So first I analytically describe an inform informal financial instrument his, whose affordances make it resistant to being digitized, right? Because now there is a push that let's digitize as many financial services as we can. I then analytically describe a mobile money infrastructure that is in fact two, infra, uh, two interacting infrastructures and I also reveal its human work. Um, I actually am not gonna talk much about this chapter in this talk because in interest of time and it's a very dense chapter, but I'll say this that when we are thinking about replicating the success of M-Pesa in Kenya around the world, what people a lot of the times focus on is the technology and not so much um, the agent infrastructure, the one that's cashing in and cashing out the digital currency. And even though that's changing now, what people certainly don't think about is other infrastructures that infrastructure is plugging into to make financial inclusion happen. And by that I mean to help the poor manage their precarity, right? And also, a lot of the time, the unglamorous human work in helping the poor manage their precarity is not a part of these conversations. So this chapter that I talk about, a lot of it is just focused on this. Um, and finally, I was there during the demonetization event that happened in India in late 2016, and I'll talk about it in more detail in a little bit. Um, I sort of describe that as a forced formalization and what effects that had. So the first thing was I looked at the interest-free informal loan, which is this very popular financial, informal financial instrument that people rely on. In fact, most of the time when the poor have you know, a sudden need of money, that's the first thing they think of. It's very, very popular because it's very, you know, the immediacy of it makes it very active. Um, they're generally short-term loans, so sometimes people will just borrow money for a few hours, sometimes it'll be a few days. Of course, you can negotiate longer loans, but generally it's short-term, because you're borrowing for people like you, who are also poor or low-income like you, right? So people don't have the wherewithal to always lend you larger sums of money or for longer times. 
Um, again, relying on the same source time and time again can induce lender fatigue. And also, like I mentioned, they're in similar circumstances, so they don't always have the bandwidth to accommodate your needs. And people are continually assessing who their potential lenders might be as the situations continue to evolve. Um, because again, people are in you know similar circumstances, so they don't they can sometimes lend to you and they some, sometimes can't. So you have to constantly curate a list of who can be potential potential lenders. Um, so this is the loan that I was looking at, and what I found was that. In theory, it was a great financial practice that could be digitized, right? Because you can just pick up the phone, you can be like, hey, I need some money, can you please uh, you know, remit some money to me over your mobile banking application? And voila, if the person agrees, they can do that. Um, so if that happens, it's perfect for being digitized. But actually, people were very resistant to doing that because um, this, this interest-free informal loan is actually maintained within proximate social networks. So like I said, because there's a continuous assessment of who might constitute a reasonable lender, it requires access to salient and timely information, and this kind of information is greatly benefited by proximity, right? So like you're walking around, you suddenly see a new you know, motorized bike outside your neighbor's house, you're like, oh, it looks like this person just came into some money. Maybe I can ask them, so, uh, you know, ask them for some help. Or you know, you know that in your savings group, some lady got like her monthly payout, so you know that she's flush for the time being, right? So this kind of information requires being close to them, and I mean close in terms of physical distance. Um, also, if you're taking you know, loans from people who are close by and for people who are in similar circumstances, they might need it at a moment's notice, right? They might be like, hey, I need my money back, and you want to be able to go and just give it to them as soon as you can. Um, and generally, this demographic that I'm describing, the urban poor is actually what I was, you know, that I was speaking with most of the times. Um, the distant social networks are generally the family and friends who live back in their native towns and villages, and they tend to be re remittance recipients rather than donors. So given this situation, given that these loans are happening in a very proximate uh, basis, actually you know, paying that fee, that small fee for mobile banking is not worth it. Also, this is like a quick quote from one of the interviews that I did. I'll just, you know, the, in the interesting thing here is basically Leela, who was one of my respondents, uh, you know, she mentions that actually when she has to ask for money from her employer and there's an obvious power, uh, you know, disparity, um, she can't just call up and be like, hey, I need some money. She needs to do the work of showing up, right? There is a mobility burden to actually asking for that money. So there is this expectation of effort, of body work, to actually commute some distance and to present yourself in person when you're actually asking somebody for money. Um, In-person interactions can help inject some gravitas into conversations, and the mobile phone may mute affect. And I'm gonna just quickly run through this. Um, okay, so yeah, that was the reason why uh, they were resist to being digitized. I'm gonna quickly talk about demonetization because this was really interesting as well. Um, I don't know how many of you guys heard of it, but basically, on the 8th of November 2016, the Prime Minister just sucked out uh, the 500,000 rupee notes from the economy, gave us four hours, said, hey, this is going to cease to be legal tender at the stroke of midnight. At 8 p.m., he tells us this. And this comp uh, comprised of 86% of the value of all banknotes in the economy. It was crazy. So, you know, just to give you a sense, there were these crazy queues outside banks because the prime minister's like, hey, you can go and change your old notes in the banks, no problem. But obviously, there were many problems because the banks were not equipped, the banks also didn't know. It was complete chaos. And somehow, luckily, I happened to find myself during that time. The reason I say luckily, even though it was not a lucky situation at all, was because now people were being forced to interact with the banks, even if they were unbanked. And they were being forced to use mobile banking because cash was scarce, right? So it was the perfect way to sort of see how a forced financial inclusion would look like. And it was interesting for me in that sense. So what I found was that demonetization was supposed to be good for the poor because the prime minister claimed he was doing this so that the rich with their black money would be forced to give up their money and it would level the playing field for the rich and the poor, right? But actually, it affected them disproportionately. It was a disruption in their lives. It was a dis disruption in my life too. But when I went to the bank, I had an account with them. They obviously were like, oh, we have to give you better service, right? I had access to the right information, so I could challenge them if they were telling me something incorrect or wrong, um, which a lot of other people who were underbanked or didn't have the necessary, uh, didn't have the right skills or the information could do. It was a welfare shock uh, because people who are in the informal economy where cash is, you know, more prevalent tend to be poor, and business gets hit when cash is suddenly scarce. The other interesting thing 
a little bit more invisible but was very interesting was that it also subtly changed people's consumption patterns. So instead of the 500 and 1,000 rupee notes, you now had 2,000 rupee notes that came into the system, but you didn't have enough smaller denomination currency to break it up. So now let's say you had a 2,000 rupee note, petrol, you know, gas stations were like, you know what, you have to buy gas for 2,000 rupees, we don't have money to make change for you. And so people would have to buy all this gas and they didn't have money left over for groceries. And I know it sounds like they can adjust and move their money around, but actually the poor really need to time their money in a way to make purchases, to sell, to borrow, else they have to rely on expensive means to get that money at that point in time, right? So it was a welfare shock. And also it was a forced technology adoption for people who again didn't necessarily have the right skills or information or access to navigate that situation. And there was definitely inadequate recourse mechanisms. So eventually demonetization was supposed to help the poor, but it actually ended up hurting them disproportionately. So yeah, with that, I am done and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Ishita. Hi. This is Raghu. Sorry, guys, I'm not from uh, Berkeley School of Information. I'm a PhD student from uh, University of the Cumberlands, and I pursue my PhD in information technology. It was a nice uh, presentation, Ishita, and uh, I would like to add a few more things uh, from in the point of uh, demonetization and informal loans. From the demonetization, uh, during 2016, November, my own brother, he got married. So you know very well how the uh, the small business guys deal with the uh, the cash transactions. So I, per, I mean, we guys personally perceive how we adopted the technology, like transferring money to my siblings' accounts yeah. and using their ATMs. And even one of my other cousins, he do he deals with uh, around uh, uh, three to four crores turnover business, and he will be carrying some lump sum cash. And that's going to be uh, waste of paper by March 2017 in the next three months. So what he did is. He implemented a risk strategy by calling his all employees and he distributed that yeah. with a, he taking care of his employees. So that gave him a brand image and he uh, increased the production, which is a uh, manufacturing mill. And moving on to the informal loan side, uh, I personally, I have gone through a couple of personal loan products. So uh, the informal loan perspective, maybe it might create a financial inclusion, but uh, the risk levels will be more. I personally believe that. Uh, yeah. what, the risk yeah. levels, of, sorry, say that but, again, the last bit. Sorry. You, you, sorry, say the last line again. So the, yeah. the, the informal loan format. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, oh, uh, the risk levels of informal yeah, that, loans that might that be more? Yeah, that increases the risk levels. Yeah, it, yeah. Because you never know, after after uh, getting a loan of a uh, lump sum amount, you never know when that specific individual can leave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I even mean, though we have some social elements. Sure. So thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, I think what we have to move away from is assuming that all kind of informal finance looks the same. So that's what I, I guess I was trying to say when I said that there's a spectrum, because there's a lot of sort of um, informal practices that happen when you're doing formal finance. Uh, a lot of that is in my dissertation as well, actually, and I'm happy to talk more about it. And a lot of formal rubrics are undertaken when you're doing informal finance as well, right? So there are very sophisticated informal finance products and tools out there that can be less risky. I'm, again, not saying that all of them are one and the same. There are, of course, risky options uh, you know, in informal finance as well. But it depends what you're looking at. And people try to accommodate uh, users in different ways. Thanks, Sushita. This is really wonderful. I'm wondering if you came across any practices where people were doing, um, continuing to do informal financial practices, but utilizing digital technologies, or if that was purely, and, it, and whether you think that's, and if not, if that's a, a short-term thing, if it was just, if informal always was on, offline as well. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely not. I mean, I definitely talk about this in my dissertation. Yes, like, relying or like moving to like mobile banking in those early days was very, very helpful for a large chunk of populations. Um, I'm, not, I'm trying to think, the thing is the way it's been set up, the discourse around this is that the moment it moves to mobile banking or anything technology related, it somehow becomes modern and formal, right? So the way I would answer that question is, were people doing some kind of informal practices in doing mobile banking? I'm sure there were. I 
can't recall right now during demonetization of everybody, anybody doing that. I know there was a lot of, oh no, that's not true. I know there was a lot of, um, if one person didn't have an account, then they would go to a friend and be like, hey, can you transfer some money for me? And that actually didn't work out for them because they didn't realize they had caps on their accounts. So when they helped out their friends as an informal kind of practice, they stopped getting money into their accounts, right? So, but at the same time, I don't want to make it sound like it's not possible to do informal finance using mobile banking, um, or rather, it's not possible to do informal practices in mobile banking that can still help you manage your precarity. Um, not necessarily with demonetization, I can't think of anything specific, but definitely in my infrastructures chapter, there's a lot of it on that, where people were helping uh, you know, the poor manage their precarity by exactly doing stuff outside of the formal rubrics. Right. Um, so we are at time, and I want to invite you to give uh, another round of applause to Ashita and to join me. Uh,